morning, everyone. Welcome to the September 2021 meeting of the South Metro Regional Safety Council. I'm Steve Roth, I'm with BWC. Happy to be with you today. Um, we have a great program planned for you and we're happy you can join us this morning on this, on this beautiful day. Um, before I get into the rest of the program, I go over the BWC announcements. So for the latest information on COVID-19 in Ohio, please visit coronavirus.ohio.gov. Uh, the deadline is approaching for the COVID-19 Indoor Air Quality Assistance Program at BWC. Funds are still available for the COVID-19 Indoor Air Quality Assistance Program. Eligible facilities have until October 15th to apply. The program provides reimbursements for eligible applicants to help cover the cost of inspections, assessments, maintenance and improvements to indoor heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems to control the spread of COVID-19. It also provides reimbursements for secondary devices designed to destroy bacteria and mold and inactivate viruses. Recently, the BWC Board of Directors have elected to renew the policy activity rebate program for the 2021 policy year. The PAR program can save employers money by having them earn up to a 50% rebate up to a maximum of $2,000 on their paid premium. To earn a rebate, employers can choose from 33 activities in our customizable plan to earn the necessary 11 credits during the policy year. Each activity is associated with helping raise employers' awareness and increase understanding of some of the most important aspects of workers' compensation, safety, claims, and policy management. Uh, you can enroll at bwc.ohio.gov. Let's see, we're in our September meeting, but I want to also let us know about what's coming up in our October meeting. Uh, the, all of the October meetings for the Safety Council across the state of Ohio are going to be uh, done a little differently this year. We're going to have a host, the BWC is hosting what we call a mega meeting. So we're going to have a statewide meeting with all, all participants across the entire state on Wednesday, October 6th at 11 a.m. And we're going to have a nationally recognized speaker, David Circus, and he's going to have the topic of leading with your heart. So that's Wednesday, October 6th at 11 a.m. You'll get additional emails from Deanna about how to join the meeting. We hope you can all make it. So that's next or next month, Wednesday, October 6th. Um, if you want to plan ahead, we're, we're having a second uh, mega meeting. It's going to be out in April, so April 13th, and we're going to have Erica Keswin speaking at that meeting as well. So those are coming up. Looking forward to those meetings. Those should be excellent. Um, looking at our September distance learning opportunities from the Division of Safety and Hygiene. We have an excellent webinar coming up next week. So you had a claim, now what? So this is September 14th from 10 a.m. to noon. So you had a claim, now what? If, you, if you're interested on, on how to manage claims and all those sort of aspects, this is the webinar for you. So you can enroll for this through the BWC Learning Center, bwclearningcenter.com. Uh, we have three remaining distance learning virtual classes this month. We have emergency preparedness planning. It's a half day workshop on September 16th. that runs from 9.30 a.m. to one. We're gonna have has health hazards and tox, excuse me, health hazards and toxicology fundamentals. And that's going to run over two days, September 28th and September 29th, each day running from 9.30 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. And then we're going to conclude the month with hazardous waste operations and emergency response awareness or HAZWAP or awareness class. And that is September 30th. And this is the four-hour HAZWAP. It runs from 9.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. It's, it's the way they work the math. Um, it's not quite four hours. Let's see. Um, to register for any of these classes or the webinar, you can find those at the bwclearningcenter.com. And for those that need BWC activity credits, whether it be the industry specific safety program, the PAR program, uh, maybe the one claim program, these are great ways to earn those activity credits. All right, our speaker this morning is Michelle Bach. Michelle is an attorney at law with Coolidge Wall, where she concentrates her practice in the area of workers' compensation defense. She has been recognized as a certified specialist in workers' compensation law by the Ohio Bar Association. Michelle represents state-funded and self-insured businesses and public entities. 
She is a skilled and experienced litigator handling many bench and jury trials in various courts of common pleas throughout Ohio. She also handles actions pending in the Court of Appeals and before the Supreme Court of Ohio. Michelle routinely advises clients regarding how to control workers' compensation costs and has been selected by her peers for inclusion in the best lawyers in America in the practice of workers' compensation law employer and has received Ohio Super Lawyers recognition. Michelle is also the past chair of our beloved South Metro Regional Safety Council Steering Committee. Thank you, Michelle. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Bach. Good morning. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that nice introduction, and it is wonderful to be with all of you, albeit virtually. This will be the first time I think I've given a presentation where I have to sit down the whole time. So for those of you who know me, we'll see how well I can do this because I normally like to be up, moving, wandering around. But it is absolutely my pleasure to be here this morning to talk about my favorite workers' compensation topic. And it may be one with which many of you are not particularly familiar, but it is going to be regarding workers' compensation court appeals and how to present a winning case. As many of you know, workers' compensation cases begin in the Industrial Commission hearing room. Claims are initially processed by the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, but if there is a contested issue, hearings take place before the Industrial Commission in a room like this one in the photo. This is actually an old photo from many years ago. It does not contain the plexiglass with which we are now very familiar due to COVID. It doesn't have the speaker at the side of the table uh, where the hearing officer sits. As you know, uh, parties can attend hearings remotely now via WebEx or by calling in. So it's a little bit of a different system, but it still works for the most part. The Industrial Commission will adjudicate issues regarding allowance of claims. So for example, whether a claim should be allowed for a herniated disc or a low back strain or a rotator cuff tear, it all starts right here in the Industrial Commission hearing room. After that process concludes, however, an order will be issued like this one in the photo in the yellow paper, and I actually brought a real one with me. I get these all the time in the mail on a daily basis, and they're very distinctive due to the yellow color, but that's how I know that I am receiving an order from an Industrial Commission hearing. After the hearing process concludes, however, the Industrial Commission will issue an order like this one, most of the time indicating that an order or an appeal from an order has been refused. This is what we call the final refusal order, and it signifies that the administrative process has concluded. So at this point, many people believe that the claim is essentially over but that's actually not true. According to the revised code, which is our statute here in Ohio, there's a statute numbered 4123.512, which indicates that a party can appeal, quote, industrial commission orders other than extent of disability to the Court of Common Pleas. So clearly that was written by someone who's a lawyer or a legislature because no one can understand what that means. But what it really means is orders regarding the allowance of claims can be appealed to the Court of Common Pleas and can end up in a jury trial. And again, many employers are completely unaware that this separate litigation process exists, but it's that process that we're going to talk about today. And just as a point of information, I probably spend about half of my time handling claims on the administrative side investigating them and working them up and attending those hearings at the Industrial Commission. And the other half of my time is spent handling workers' compensation litigation in the Court of Common Pleas. This is a photo of a courtroom in Montgomery County. And obviously it looks a lot different from the Industrial Commission hearing room that I showed at the beginning. It's a completely different setup. It's a different forum and the procedures are very different from what is used before the Industrial Commission. The first thing I'm sure you will notice is there are a lot more chairs in this setup and they are in a different configuration. 
You have the judge who will sit, of course, in the big black chair by the flag. There's a witness podium. There are two council tables. And of course, there are several chairs to the side, and those are chairs for the jurors. Appeals that are pending in court are decided either by a jury or sometimes by a judge if the parties waive the jury. And we're going to talk about this process now. But first of all, I think we need to talk about why would you even engage in this process? As you're going to hear, it's a fairly lengthy process. It can be an expensive process. You have to be represented by an attorney who is licensed to practice in the court of law. You cannot be represented by a third party administrator. You would have to retain an attorney to represent your interests. So why would you go through this process? One benefit of a court appeal is the power to conduct what we call additional discovery. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But when your case is pending in court, there are many more tools for you to use to obtain information about the claim, how the injury happened, uh, additional facts that may benefit you with respect to trying to defend the allowance of the claim. The second primary benefit of a court appeal is to posture a difficult case for settlement. Most of the cases that are appealed to the Court of Common Pleas are settled, and hopefully it could be settled to the employer's advantage, otherwise why would you be doing it? But you certainly want to maintain any and all leverage that you may have. If you give up on the allowance of the claim and do not exercise your appeal rights, clearly you are not going to have nearly as much leverage with respect to negotiating a settlement. For example, if your teenager asks you for the keys to your car and you've already given them to the teenager, your chances of getting those back successfully are clearly diminished. By contrast, if you hold on to the keys and don't actually give them to the teenager until there's some negotiation about where you're going, what time you're going to be home, and so forth, you're in a much better bargaining position. So the court appeal can be very advantageous with respect to helping you negotiate a settlement. But the third, and hopefully the primary benefit of the court appeal, is you want to win your case. And of course, that's my job, to do anything and everything that I can to win this case if it actually goes forward to a trial. And the benefit of winning the case is, if you're a state-funded employer, you would be credited whatever has been paid for the allowance that you were successful in overturning. So clearly, the cases that are appealed to court normally do have more um, financial exposure, usually with injured workers who have had a long period of disability, who have had extensive medical treatment, and so forth. So let's talk about the mechanics of this revised code 4123.512 appeal and exactly how it works. The appeal begins by filing a pleading called a notice of appeal. You know, clever, catchy name, right? It's a very short, uh, usually uh, two, three paragraph pleading that is prepared by an attorney and actually filed with the court. You do have to pay a filing fee. It's normally about $250. So the notice of appeal is the document that would initiate the lawsuit. I should also mention that, of course, if the claimant is the losing party, they have the right to appeal the denial of their claim to the Court of Common Pleas as well, and they would be filing a similar document called the Notice of Appeal. The next step in this process is the filing of a complaint. What's interesting about workers' compensation law is even if the employer is the losing party and they file the notice of appeal, the claimant is always the plaintiff and they are the party who is always required to file a complaint. Now normally you would think if you're the party suing someone else, you would be the plaintiff and would have to file the complaint. But what is advantageous to employers with respect to this setup is even if you, the employer, are filing the appeal, the claimant is the, com is the plaintiff and they bear the burden of proof and must prove their entitlement to participate in the benefits of the Workers' Compensation Fund 
what we call de novo, because again, as lawyers, we like Latin phrases and phrases that people do not readily understand. So de novo is essentially meaning you're looking at it with a fresh eye. So when this Court of Appeals or Court of Common Pleas process begins, the jurors will have no idea what happened administratively before the Industrial Commission. They will not even know there was a process before the Industrial Commission. They will be looking at everything with a completely fresh eye and making their own independent determination. But again, what is helpful is the claimant bears the burden of proving his or her case. So the claimant will file the complaint and then the employer will file a legal pleading called an answer. So after that paperwork is filed with the court, uh, the case will move forward. And in terms of it moving forward, the process that will commence at that time is called the discovery process. Remember I had referred earlier to the fact that a benefit of the court appeal is that you're able to discover additional information. That can be accomplished in a couple of different ways. When the case is pending in court, you have the right to issue what are called, again, big fancy word, interrogatories, which are essentially written questions that the claimant is legally required to answer. You also have the power to obtain all of their medical records, and that can be a great source of information about whether they've had prior problems and the extent of the problems they are claiming from this alleged injury. So the parties can exchange that, what we call paper discovery. Discovery in general requires a lot of detective work. And this is one of the parts of my job that I really enjoy. It's very interesting to find out as much information as you can about, for example, whether this injury could actually happen as they have claimed. Is there additional factual information that would prove it could not possibly happen as they are saying it did in fact occur? Just to give you a quick example, I'm dealing with a case now for uh, a client that they, it's a manufacturing facility, I guess we'll just leave it at that. And the injured worker claimed that he was injured when he slipped off of a, like a metal platform while he was using a pendant crane to move a massive piece of tooling, uh, probably about six feet by five feet, weighing you know thousands upon thousands of pounds. And he claims that he was alone, uh, no one was supervising him, and he was fully trained to do the work. Well, upon investigating this, my client says, no, he was within his probationary period, he was literally working shoulder to shoulder with a supervisor the whole entire time. We would never have a probationary employee perform this type of work that could be very dangerous by himself. And literally it was night and day in terms of uh, the two different stories that were being presented by the parties. So when you have a case pending in court, it gives you an even greater opportunity to do all of this really fun detective work. The second aspect of discovery is the ability to take a deposition. You typically do not have that opportunity when a case is just pending before the Industrial Commission. And I know some of you have probably heard me speak before and I always like to say that I am incredibly inquisitive. You know how two-year-olds are constantly asking why, 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 or they just keep asking questions and they will not stop. I feel like I literally never grew out of that. I'm obviously middle-aged now, but I love to ask tons and tons of questions, and this makes me very well suited to this part of my job because when you get to this stage, you're able to take a deposition of the injured worker. So you're sitting down at a conference table, like in the photo. The injured worker may or may not look as surly as the woman in the photo. But normally, it's, it's my job to try to develop rapport with the witness, to make them feel comfortable, to get them to open up and to talk. Uh, another fascinating part of my work is I've learned over the years that if you give a person an opportunity to answer 
close to the same question more than once, ask a, this, not exactly the same, but a similar question two or three times, it's quite interesting uh, whether the answers are consistent or if they're not. Oftentimes, if people are not being truthful, they can really talk themselves into a deep, deep hole that can be used, of course, later when we actually get to the trial, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the deposition can be an invaluable source of information. Uh, you can ask them anything and everything about the case, about their prior medical history, whether they've had similar problems, have they been involved in an auto accident, and obviously you can see I could go on and on with all of these questions that I have running through my mind. So the deposition can be incredibly useful. The next part of building your case in the Court of Common Pleas is to obtain a defense independent medical examination if you have not already done so. For those of you who have heard me talk before, I always stress the importance of getting an IME when your case is pending administratively so you can really be putting your best foot forward. In my other presentations, if you've heard them, it's usually about the sports analogies and I always refer to the IME as basically your helmet and why in the world would you want to play the game without your helmet on. It really is one of the most important pieces of equipment and something that you will absolutely have to have when a case is pending in the Court of Common Pleas. So by the defense IME, what I'm referring to is, thank you, Carl. Most of the time my clicker works, but not 100% is hiring a doctor that you know, that I know and trust, that I have dealt with before, to examine the injured worker. And our doctor would take a very detailed history, review all of the medical records that I've been gathering, as I explained earlier, would review any and all factual information that I might have, witness statements, and so on. And that doctor would issue a written report, and of course they will be an integral part of the case as we move forward in this presentation, you'll see how all of this unfolds. Many of these workers' compensation cases absolutely depend upon the medical evidence. You want to select your doctor very, very carefully. You want to make sure that he or she has the appropriate credentials and is in the appropriate area of expertise. You want to make sure that they know how to testify, that they testify well, and that their credentials either match or are at least similar to the anticipated expert witness from the claimant. Now the claimant, of course, is going to call their treating physician to testify. Either, you know, it might be more of a hired gun on the claimant's bar, someone that they have selected or referred the claimant to, and those of you who are familiar with this can probably run those names through your mind very easily. Or it could just be their family doctor or, or an orthopedic surgeon, most commonly, who has rendered the treatment. Now those witnesses may or may not be familiar with testifying during a deposition, but these cases absolutely often are a battle of the experts in terms of whether the jurors are going to believe their testimony or find them to be the most credible. And actually here I was just talking about the doctor's deposition is the last step in essentially building your case in the Court of Common Pleas. The doctor's deposition you can see looks a little different than the claimant deposition photo and that's primarily because there will be a videographer present to videotape the testimony. So the doctors obviously have very busy schedules. You're not going to be able to pay them to testify live at trial, but rather their depositions will be scheduled in advance by the parties. They will testify and be videotaped. And then at trial, those videos are just popped in and shown to the jurors. So the doctor's deposition is absolutely essential you want to make certain that that is very well done, uh, that your cross-examination of the claimant's expert is well done, and that you are presenting your own testimony in the best light possible. 
All right, so we've gone through those four pillars, and once you've completed that whole process, if the case does in fact move forward, you would actually have a trial at the courthouse in a room like the one that I showed you in a courtroom at the Court of Common Pleas. But oftentimes, these cases do not actually make it all the way to trial. Only a few of them, for example, in my practice, and we have a very busy practice, we probably have trials set on our calendar about every week. So, you know, that's clearly a fairly significant number. But as to how many cases I actually try every year, it can vary maybe three, four, five, six or so a year. So clearly the majority of these cases are being resolved in a different fashion. But just as a point of information, sometimes you can file, again, a fancy phrase that appears to mean nothing when you say it out loud, but you can file what's called a motion for summary judgment in certain situations, which would be a motion you would file before trial, basically arguing that you should receive judgment in your client's favor without having to go to a trial. So sometimes you can file that type of a motion. It is very rare. I've probably only had a few summary judgment motions granted in my career. So when you get one, it's obviously very memorable and uh, certainly feels like a very good accomplishment. You can try to file a motion or make a motion for a directed verdict, which actually would be um, at various stages once the trial process has started. And in fact, I have a case set for trial next week that looks like it is going to go forward, but I plan to raise a motion for a directed verdict in that case, which again is very unusual, but just a quick story. This woman is alleging a knee injury. She worked on an assembly line and had to, she's working on an engine that is on a pallet. The pallet has a lever that she would have to kick or touch to get the engine to spin around because of course you have to work on one side of the engine, spin it, work on the other side. She claimed she had a knee injury from kicking this pallet lever. We actually were unsuccessful administratively and we have appealed the case to court and we're trying to overturn the allowance of this claim. Her doctor is supporting a knee strain as it turns out, a strain pertains to muscles and a sprain with a P is defined as involving ligaments. The knee does not have muscles. It is a joint that only has ligaments. So through my cross-examination, I believe he admitted that there is no such thing as a left knee strain. So I'm hoping to submit this motion for a directed verdict and have the judge agree with me that that part of the case, there are actually two conditions, a knee strain and a patellofemoral chondral defect is the other condition at issue. But I'm hoping to wipe out that left knee strain with this special type of motion. So cross your fingers for me. The other way that cases um, might, might be resolved short of trial, of course, would be settlement, and that is very common. As I mentioned at the outset, oftentimes these cases are appealed to court for the purpose of obtaining a settlement, and I should mention that that absolutely is a common every day of the week strategy of claimants' counsel. They are filing these court appeals knowing that they are expensive for employers to defend, knowing an employer must hire an attorney, that it's a long, you know, fairly arduous process that could take months to a year. Um, the courts are also incredibly backed up due to COVID. Many, many trials were postponed and now the dockets are really jammed. So settlement, again, is a very common way that these cases fizzle out but they're still pending in court and they are you know, at least starting through this process. The last way that you might avoid a trial in the case is for the case to be dismissed. This is also fairly common 
And getting back again to the point that I made that even if the employer is the party who appeals the case to court, the claimant is still the plaintiff, which again is kind of an odd concept to wrap your head around. But interestingly, the law indicates that a plaintiff may dismiss their lawsuit one time, what we call without prejudice, again, big fancy words that are hard to understand, but essentially you can do it one time without any harm to you as long as you refile it within one year from the date that you file the dismissal. So basically you can just dismiss the case, put it on the back burner, and refile it within a year, but this is really only something that claimants can do. Employers can try to do that. It's, it would have to be by stipulation, meaning that the parties would have to agree, and it gets very sticky, uh, but it is very common for claimants to dismiss their cases and then refile them. All right, so let's assume we have gotten through all of those hurdles we're actually going to tee it up, we're really going to have a trial, and so now we're going to talk about how that works. If we were live and all together, we would have a lively discussion at this point about whether any of you have been a juror, and I'm always curious to find out if people have been. I have never been called to jury duty. I am hugely disappointed by this. I vote, I don't understand why I've never been called. This is like a complete mystery to me. I know that lawyers are usually excused, but I would still love to be part of the process and I love to hear about people's experiences. It is normally uh, more common for people to participate in a criminal trial, which of course has a different burden of proof than a civil trial like a workers' comp case or a personal injury lawsuit contract dispute, something like that. But unfortunately, I can't chat with you about whether you've been jurors, but we can talk about the voir dire, again, fancy foreign language phrase, process, which essentially means jury selection. The trial will begin with the jury selection, which is a very psychologically interesting process where the judge will start by asking a series of questions and then the claimant's attorney will ask questions, then the defendant's attorneys have an opportunity and based upon the responses that you get, the attorneys have to make a very conscious, strategic decision uh, regarding the jurors that they want to keep each side gets three challenges without cause, basically without any reason, but you can also excuse people if there is cause to do so. Um, and people are clever. Some people I think are familiar with the system or may have been called before, or someone tells them what to say so they can be excused. But by and large, I think people are, are willing to do their civic duty. It is a civic duty. It's a massive inconvenience, uh, especially with COVID. I haven't had a trial during COVID. The one that I have next week will be the first that I've had where there may be different procedures in place. The courts have had to be very creative. It's my understanding that the jury pool, because normally what happens, I guess, just to explain in case you're not familiar, uh, roughly 30 to 40 people will be summoned for jury duty. And typically they would just line up in the hallway, they'd be sitting on the benches, you bring them all into the courtroom, and of course you're shoulder to shoulder to shoulder with 30 to 40 people, which would be completely contrary to social distancing and what we're trying to do in the era of COVID. So it's my understanding that sometimes they're breaking them up into two different courtrooms that are being linked by cameras. So again, I just can't even imagine as an attorney trying to develop rapport with people when you're doing it by video and all sorts of strange mechanics. I was in this courtroom where I will have my trial next week and it's, I mean, there it is full of these plexiglass barriers. Um, so it is, it's going to be an interesting experience. But again, it's my job to hopefully the jurors will trust me, will know that I'm credible, 
that they should believe what I am saying and everything that I say or do I think is something that they are observing including my client and by the way you know quick feel my pain story I mean I had a client who attended a trial with me and I constantly had to wake him up I'm like hey if you do not find this interesting <laughs> or if you are not showing that you are interested in this case or the outcome again they are watching everything that you do I tell my clients literally from the moment you open your car door when you're at the parking lot to get out at the courthouse you need to presume that a juror could be watching you and might end up um, adjudicating our case so it's very important to be super professional and to be cognizant that they are just soaking everything in so we will go through this voir dire process we will ask them questions uh, we will try to select eight impartial people who will adjudicate the case and make a decision and it's it's a very tricky thing to do because even though you're questioning people about their beliefs and their past experiences and so forth um, it's really kind of a, a judgment call and sometimes I think it's a bit of a crapshoot too. We will seat the jury and then the attorneys will present their opening statements again with claimants counsel going first and then defense counsel second. I like to think of opening statement as like a movie trailer. It's a little preview of the evidence and a preview of what's to come. I don't like to reveal too much, but you have to give them enough to know what your case is about and to hopefully be persuaded by what you're going to present. So opening statement can be, um, I've seen some that have been pretty good. I've seen some that have been super dry. Uh, I do like to use demonstrative evidence and we'll talk about that in a little bit. I think that's incredibly important. Uh, during opening statement, I encourage them to listen and to listen very carefully. And that's a key part of um, my presentation as well. I feel like, okay, here we go. So at this point, normally the claimant will testify. And this can be critically important. In fact, uh, many years ago, I had a conversation with a colleague who represented injured workers, and he was a fair, a fair bit older than I am, extremely experienced, and a good lawyer. And I will never forget him looking at me, and we were talking about a trial that we had coming up with each other, which actually didn't go forward. But he said, he said, Michelle, he said, it's basically this simple. If they like my lady, his injured worker was a female, if they like my lady, I win. They don't like my lady, you win. And I remember thinking, really? Like I'm putting my heart and my soul and my time and my three o'clock, you know, 3 a.m. wake up calls and everything into these cases. And you're saying basically it comes down to whether the jurors like your lady? I mean, clearly, hopefully the attorneys play some role or there's some skill or something that we can bring to the table. But I, I think of that frequently. I don't think that's the only factor, but I do think it is a huge factor about whether the juror likes the claimant and very, very importantly, whether they find them to be believable. And that is just human nature. I mean, we are constantly evaluating people's credibility, whether we think they are truthful, whether you can believe their story, but I've actually made them, I was, was about to say the mistake Early on in my career, I always wanted to talk to every juror if I could. Usually the judge permits it, sometimes not. And if they want to talk to you, they can. And of course, if they don't, that's the end of the discussion. But I mean, sometimes I would listen to them afterward and even if I won, they would latch onto something that I wasn't really emphasizing or I didn't think was important or, so it's, it's just a fascinating process. But in any event, the claimant's testimony, I think, is very important. Um, they will present their information, their testimony, and then, of course, uh, employer's counsel would have the ability to cross-examine them. Okay, and so here's uh, my, 
I'll have to make this relatively quick story. Case I had years ago about a woman who claimed she had chronic regional pain syndrome. When it's legitimate, it's extremely painful, excruciating, very disabling, and can be an extremely expensive claim. This woman alleged she could not use her right hand or arm at all. When I observed her at the Industrial Commission for hearings, she would not move her arm at all. I would watch her very carefully, like even when she would come and go from the commission, she would never pick up her purse, she wouldn't hold her cell phone, you know, wouldn't hold a water bottle, basically acted like she could not use it at all. So her claim was allowed for this extremely expensive condition. She's from a small town, and my employer is too, and my employer was adamant that there had to be some monkey business going on, but they weren't sure what. So they agreed we should try surveillance, which I do not recommend frequently. It can be expensive. Um, a lot of times they don't go anywhere or you don't find anything of value but they were adamant that they felt like she was not being truthful. So we send the investigator out to check her out. And luckily, we caught her on a very active day. And again, I feel incredibly confined that I'm sitting in this chair because <laughs> normally I would hop up to give my demonstration, but basically she was out in her yard and she had what you can see in the photo, these ginormous poles that were like a homemade volleyball net. And she goes over and hoists up that pole in the photo and starts doing this number to wrap the net around the pole. And I mean, when I saw this on my computer, of course I'm blown away. I mean, this woman says she can't even like lift up a coffee cup. And also the investigator saw her I think it's on the next slide, mowing, which, okay, maybe you can mow with just one hand, but I mean, the mowing that she was doing was on very uneven terrain. There's like a giant hill she goes up. She's kind of like maneuvering it up over these rocks and twisting and turning it in all these directions. So needless to say, that trial was actually a lot of fun because during her testimony, I was able to cross-examine her uh, including with this surveillance. And again, just to circle back to what we talked about before, about the importance of taking her deposition. Remember that conversation where I get to ask all of my whys, whys, whys in the presence of a court reporter? Well, of course, the court reporter is transcribing that word for word. And I was very careful to systematically go through, you know, well, what can you do? And, you know, you can't use your arm to you know, pick up a pen or you can't, and it was all these very simple examples. She was adamant she could never use her arm at all. And then we had this very dramatic surveillance footage. So needless to say, we were successful in winning that case. And as a result, um, my client received well over a six figure um, amount of money back for overturning that claim. All right, so the next step in this process would be the claimant's expert would testify, and of course, I would have cross-examined him. That circles back to the photo of the doctors testifying via video, and then the videos would be played at the trial. So the claimant would testify, she would have her expert testify, and then it would be typically the employer's opportunity to present their case. Sometimes the employer might have a lay witness. And to give you a good example for my trial next week, again, this woman saying she was kicking that pallet lever and spinning the engine around, I'm going to have a lay witness. He is the engineering manager at this facility and I'm hoping that this will uh, be very persuasive. But what's interesting about this case is this injured worker, um, this is not her real name, but let's call her Mary, is very, very dramatic. This woman talks a thousand miles a minute, is extremely emotionally invested in her case, 
and she is adamant um, that this knee injury happened from kicking this pallet lever. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because it's also interesting as cases move through this process, even before the Industrial Commission, which normally is a two-step hearing process, how their testimony changes from the first hearing to the second hearing to their deposition and then when they're at trial. And this lady, I think she started off being truthful, but it's just this big snowball effect and I think she's just gotten really into it and she's just exaggerating everything. In the beginning, she said the pallet lever stuck and it was a little harder to push than normal. Well, by the time I took her deposition, again, which is under oath before the presence of a court reporter and transcribed word for word, I have her locked down in the deposition to indicate the pallet lever completely stuck. Basically, she is describing kicking an immovable object and it would not move at all. Again, remember I described you have to work on one side of the engine, spin it around with the pallet lever, and then work on the other side. So I asked her and she confirmed during the deposition, there's actually a pallet lever on both sides, the left and the right, and they work like windshield wipers moving in the same direction. She says the one on the left stuck, but not to worry, the one on the right worked so she could spin it around, complete the work, and on it went. And again, this is an assembly line facility. So it's, these engines are you know, moving from station to station to station, hundreds of people working on them. So my approach is to have the engineering manager testify and hopefully this will be very interesting. He's gonna bring a box of parts. He's gonna bring the pallet lever and the basic mechanism of how this works and he's going to testify that those windshield wiper level levers are connected underneath by a steel bar that I intend to be waving around the whole entire time. And basically, if the one is stuck, the other one is also stuck because they are connected and they are working in tandem underneath. Now, why is this important? This is important because there is no way this happened the way she said. And if it did happen the way she said, with basically being completely stuck, at an assembly line facility, this is like a five alarm fire. If that pallet lever is completely stuck and you can't spin that engine round to be working on both sides of it, the line completely has to shut down. Like a fire, the mechanics would be swooping into that area to fix it, to take it off. And you know, you're paying people, I mean, you're manufacturing 350 of these a day and basically the whole entire line would be shut down and there is absolutely no evidence that that happened. So that is a quick example of the type of lay witness testimony that an employer could present. And then of course I would be popping in the video of my doctor's testimony and the jurors would watch that. And then we get to closing argument, right? The attorney's time to hopefully shine and to argue the case. They do call it opening statement for a reason and closing argument. You're not really supposed to be arguing in the beginning. It's just that movie trailer and kind of a little preview of what the evidence will show. Closing argument is the opportunity for the attorney to bring all of that together. And again, maybe that'll be where I'm brandishing my steel rod. <laughs> but I guess I just wanted to give you um, a couple of additional examples of ways to handle closing argument. And one of my favorites is what I colloquially call my grapefruit case. I had a woman, again, with a knee injury, and again, a woman who tends to exaggerate. And she indicated that after her knee injury, her knee swelled. And I was very careful to ask her about this during her deposition. 
And I know these are tough questions to answer, but again, the human psychology is absolutely fascinating. If you ask someone to describe the swelling or the size, nine and a half times out of 10, they will hesitate because that's a little hard question to answer. You probably never really thought about how to describe swelling. But then when I throw out to them, you know, was it the size of like, you know, a quarter, a golf ball, you know, a softball, you know, how would you describe it? Well, when I threw that out to this lady, she was adamant her knee was swollen the size of a grapefruit. Okay, not really had that before. Well, the fascinating part is she went and obtained medical treatment that very same day. So of course I pin her down in the depots. Oh, so it's something very obvious. Yes, so anyone would see it. Yes, so the doctor would definitely see it if it was that large. Yes. Well, you look at those notes, it says specifically no swelling. No swelling at all. So I, the day before my trial with this case, I dispatched my husband to Kroger and I said, go pick out a reasonably sized grapefruit. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, not the biggest one, not the smallest one, you know, something in the middle, something that looks reasonable. So I had my grapefruit in my briefcase the whole time. And a closing argument, I held it up and said, you know, do you think the doctor missed this? I mean, do you think he missed this? No, he didn't miss it. So it's just an example of even common objects can be very, very persuasive. And especially I have discovered as time has gone on with all of this technology, with everyone obsessed with their phones, myself included, I'm ashamed to admit, and just the attention spans of people, I think is just significantly decreasing. You know, we're used to like scrolling through on our phones. We don't even really read the news article. We're just kind of reading the headline and then skipping on to the next. So I think it's made it even more important for me to have the demonstrative evidence or some sort of a visual, even if it's a picture or something that you draw on the fly, or if it's a number that you emphasize, it really has to be something that people can look at because we just, we just do not have the focus and the concentration that I think we used to have. All right, so my last closing argument example was another case involving the chronic regional pain syndrome. This woman uh, had a very legitimate injury. She, and sometimes I look at my cases and think, why in the world would any person do this? This is so dangerous, this is so scary. She was cleaning a massive uh, industrial uh, conveyor belt piece of equipment, very large, with a rag. So of course she's holding the rag and it gets caught in the conveyor. It pulls her hand in to the conveyor and she had a pretty significant crush injury. That was absolutely undisputed. Well, then she tried to get this chronic regional pain syndrome, which as I said before, super expensive, can be very debilitating when it's real. Crush injuries are the number one cause of chronic regional pain syndrome. So I'm like, great, loving this case so far. You know, I like to win every single one and I'm super competitive. I wasn't really liking my facts, um, but her doctor, I do not believe did a very good job. What I emphasized is chronic regional pain syndrome has to be supported by objective criteria. We talk about this all the time, the difference between subjective and objective. Objective, as I tried to demonstrate in my slide, is something that you can actually measure, like taking your temperature, using a tape measure. It's something like a diagnostic test, like an x-ray. It's something you can actually see, see and measure. Subjective is, I'm in excruciating pain. I've never had pain like this before, and I can't even tell you how much agony I'm in. So I had to emphasize the objective because of course, this is a very sympathetic woman and a very serious injury. 
Chronic regional pain syndrome, if you listen to the gobbledygook that the doctors say, there are 11 objective criteria. So I decided to use this puzzle analogy because otherwise, so I turned all of the objective criteria into these puzzle pieces. And there are different categories of them like this vasomotor. And you know, I tried to demonstrate it this way because otherwise you're just repeatedly listing off 11 gobbledygook things that the doctors say. So I had a whole bunch of slides with these different puzzle pieces and I'm not giving you all of them here. I emphasize the fact that her doctor unbelievably said that just one of those objective criteria would be sufficient to make a diagnosis of chronic regional pain syndrome. Just one out of 11. And I said, if you only had one piece out of 11, and I know there are 12 on my slide, but you're supposed to ignore that. If you just had one, how are you gonna know what the picture is if you just have one, or maybe you have two? Even if you have two, are you going to be able to make the diagnosis? Or three? It's going to take a while before you have enough information, enough of those criteria to see the picture and to make the diagnosis. And so I made the point that there is no way you can make this diagnosis with just one. So that's just another example of how you can try to portray things in a more accessible way. All right, so after the closing argument, your case is essentially over. The judge will read pages and pages and pages of horrible, boring jury instructions that the attorneys will write. There is no way to make them interesting. They are critically important from a legal standpoint, um, but very, very tedious and terrible. At that point, the jurors will go deliberate, and believe it or not, sometimes they do get the pizza, I've had juries deliberate over dinner and the court will give them the pizza just to kind of keep things going and hopefully they can come to a decision. Which is the verdict, the rendering of the verdict, that heart-stopping, heart-pumping moment where you're standing up there <laughs> waiting for the judge to read it. And these verdicts are really a yes or a no. It's not about money, it's not about dollars, it's not about you're gonna get a million dollars, you're gonna get $10,000, it's a yes or a no. Yes, you have the right to participate for whatever it is, that knee strain, chondral defect, herniated disc, rotator cuff tear, or no, you are not. And then of course, um, the outcome of that verdict can have a significant impact upon the employer as we discussed. Hopefully, you're going to win your case, get your credit back. If you're a self-insured employer and you're in the Cisco fund, you can get a refund that way as well. Well, folks, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. And if you have any questions, just give me a call. Enjoy your day and have a great day, folks. Thank you.